Today, the band is back together. Kelly Victory rejoins us. She is home with us again, and she'll give you an update on, really, on her health, on so much that's been going on. It just, things continue to clarify themselves. Some of you may not have seen that clip we were just uh, airing. That was almost two years ago, and uh, boy, have things changed. Uh, and the things we were complaining about back then, now are axiomatic. Now that just everyone just accepts it. There we go. Uh, we also joined by Kevin Bass. Um, he is uh, on Twitter at Kevin N. Bass, B-A-S-S. -S. He originally started as someone who was very uh, condemning of people like me and Kelly, and then himself, when he wasn't towing the line precisely to the letter, some people turned on him and he started examining some of the uh, assumptions and notions that were being slammed down his throat and thought, hey, something is very, very wrong. And we are going to talk today with Kevin, who's no longer in medical school for really ridiculous reasons. He will be again soon, no doubt. We're going to really talk about perhaps what has gone wrong in medicine after this. Our laws, as it pertain to substances, are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? Uh, I'm just saying. You go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it, I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. You can spend thousands of dollars and dozens of hours trying to look a few years younger, or you can skip all that and the hassle and go with what works, GenuCell Skin Care. GenuCell is the secret to better skin. Their products are made in the USA using a proprietary technology that combines a naturally effective base with non-GMO ingredients. In fact, you might have witnessed the astonishing effects of GenuCell during a recent unplanned moment of our show. When just a little GenuCell XV restored my skin within minutes right before your eyes. That is how fast these products work. I know I'm a snob about the products I use on my face. Everybody knows it. Every time I go to the dermatologist's office, they're just rows and rows of different creams. Retinols, vitamin C cream, under eye cream, night creams. Scrubs. And then when I get to the counter, they're overpriced. All kinds of products that you can all find at GenuCell.com. Susan and I love GenuCell so much, we've created our own bundle so you can try our favorite anti-wrinkle creams, correcting serums, under eye treatments, Say goodbye to those fine lines, forehead wrinkles, skin redness, even those dark under eye bags. Women and men of all skin types, GenuCell has got you covered. Order right now at GenuCell.com slash Drew to save 50%, actually over 50%, and you'll get a free luxury spa box plus free shipping. That is GenuCell.com slash Drew, G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash D-R-E-W. Whoop. Uh, and uh, I thought we were going to do Dr. Kelly's uh, intro, the the one we've had uh, from Caleb. Help me with this. Are we going to air it that when Darn I introduce it, I her or are we just going to bring her? I don't have yeah? it. You're going to Go just bring her, bring her right oh, in. Okay. Well, everyone knows who she is. So Kelly Victory, everybody, welcome back. Hey, great to be back. We do good to have the band back together, but uh, I'll do my own intro. Yeah, I, I was thinking about it. That intro is so per, you know, because it's it summarizes exactly what uh, you and I've been talking about for two plus years now, Drew. Which is that in my mind, there is nothing in medicine that doesn't boil down to a risk benefit calculation. Uh, and the last thing I said on that intro was, we are in uncharted territory here, Drew. And that's how I felt for the last two plus years uh, that we've been doing these shows. And we remain in uncharted territory. Every day, what we are yeah. seeing is just unbelievable. I, I think uncharted is a kind way of describing through the looking glass, <laughs> frankly. And, and today, yeah. and today we are going to... Today we're going to talk about speaking through the looking glass. So uh, that is that Bulgaria behind you, or exactly, Kiev or what, said, what's going exactly on? as I said, it's an undisclosed location in Eastern Europe. <laughs> That's what I'm calling it, uh, or or a really good studio backdrop. You decide. There you go. Fair <laughs> enough. Uh, but you know, one one of the things that uh, you know before some people the people listening to podcasts and re-airing of this thing don't did not see the little intro clip we re-aired me and Kelly speak 
speaking with Jay Bhattacharya two years, nearly two years ago. Right. And it's just extraordinary the things we were talking about are now sort of axiomatic. I mean, people now understand, for instance, that six feet was a complete and utter fabrication right. out of thin air. No, and Drew, this is really important because, you know, you and I make light of it sometimes, but I said from the very, very beginning of the pandemic, and I'm talking January 2020, I talked about the fallacy of masks to stop the spread of respiratory viruses. I talked about the made-up construct, and that's what it was, of social distancing. I talked about the damage that we've known for decades occur as a result of lockdowns. I talked about the fallacy of asymptomatic spread and on and on. And I was derided, ridiculed, censored, kicked off every social media platform, had seven different um, assaults on my medical license and had to defend myself seven different, to seven different times in front of the medical board. And now fast forward, here we are in March of 2024, and it is now well established. Anthony Fauci has said it. You know, Deborah Birx has said it. Rochelle Walensky has said it. They've all come out and acknowledged, well, turns out social distancing was made up. They freely acknowledge they made up the six foot distance. It was based on not a lick of science. They acknowledge that the masks did virtually nothing to stop the spread of the respiratory virus. They acknowledge the profound learning losses for example, that occurred as a result of the lockdowns. So here we are. And rather than being contrite about these things, they instead have said, wow, you know, well, what, if we knew then what we know now, and I say that's a bunch <laughs> of hooey because I knew, I didn't say what I was saying in 2020, Drew, because I'm a really good guesser. You know, I said it because we've known these things because that's what the literature told us, because that's what the science uh, and the science is not Anthony Fauci, what the real science told us. And the problem is that these things that we did, whether it's mask wearing or social distancing or lockdowns, weren't just an inconvenience. They weren't just a nuisance. They had profound impacts. They left a smoldering crater where our economy used to be. They had profound impacts on people's not only physical health, but their social, emotional health as well. We destroyed the lives and livelihoods of tens of millions of people with these uh, mm -hmm. ridiculous mitigation schemes that had not a chance in hell of stopping the spread of this virus. And so I think that we really need people to, to be held to account. Guys. Yeah, it's it's what's up, oh, Kelly? Hold for just I, a I second. We, we have to uh, we have yeah. to give Kelly her correct intro. There's nothing in medicine that doesn't <laughs> work down go. to Here a comes. risk benefit calculation. <laughs> it is the mandate, public health, to consider the impact of any particular mitigation scheme on the entire population. This is uncharted territory, Drew. Now I feel like I'm When did you tape that? That was like 20, that was taped in- 2021, like, probably. No, before she was on the show. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well-, well but, but it's interesting. And, and, and you know, I don't so have my skull anymore. I don't have poor, you know, poor Yorick is not in the backdrop. That's the only one, my new backdrop. <laughs> I don't have my, uh, uh, alas, poor Yorick. Uh, anyway. But it's interesting when you, you know, we've been talking about mitigation schemes and how they wouldn't work. But what's when you when you think about the history of what we went through, it was more bizarre than people leaning on mitigation schemes that, as you said, did not have a chance of working. We went from mitigation to zero COVID to to right. stop, you know, eliminating COVID, which is right. insanity, just total insanity. Exactly. And then, as you said, no consideration of risk reward. And that's the part that was egregious. That's the part that was so crazy mm -hmm. to me because you could easily predict. And as you said, also, if we'd only known, look, you might have known if you hadn't crushed everybody who tried to raise their hand and say, hey, hey, over here, you might be, we, we might exactly. have some differing ideas. And one of the things that I really want, I'm hoping we get into in this hour, uh, including with Kevin, is this idea that there was, there's been a seismic shift, Drew, in how physicians, may, our own colleagues, thought about this. You started hearing people say ridiculous things like, well, if we could just prevent one death, or if we could, you know, yes. two, do we, if we could just eliminate COVID, you're thinking, wait a minute. Since when yeah. has that ever been the goal? 
It isn't. We have never asked the rest of the public to suffer so that we can, you know, potentially prevent one death. There is no such thing in medicine as taking one for the team, for example. You have yeah, the right to bodily right. autonomy. And all of a sudden, all of our colleagues left this and adopted this um, equity uh, sort of model of healthcare. Very, very dangerous. And there was a seismic shift towards everything has to do with the community, the communal, rather. And we abdicated, we asked people to abdicate control, to give up their civil liberties, to do things that had never been requested of them in the past for some sort of ethereal idea that we were going to eradicate this you know, relatively, uh, you know, inconsequential respiratory virus, because we knew, again, uh, you know, of all the lies perpetrated uh, during the pandemic, and that's a long list from which to choose, the worst one, perhaps, was that we were all at equivalent risk, when we knew from the right. very beginning that the vast majority of people had a de minimis risk from COVID. It was really just the elderly and the uh, immune compromised and those people who were otherwise ill with with chronic diseases. And so instead we penalized the majority of the people who are healthy and well, and we asked them not only to give up their lives and livelihoods, but we we really harmed their health in so many ways by, you know, not, you know, start from not getting screening exams, you know, the number of people who missed their mammogram or their colonoscopy, or the people who just were too afraid to go to the ER with chest pain for fear of, you know, they might, you know, contract COVID. So we we really mm -hmm. uh, harmed people, harmed them. Uh, and we breached what I consider to be every yeah. ethical rule. And again, I will get into this, the ethical rules of, of healthcare, which, by the way, they don't even bother teaching in medical school. Well, that that's what I want to get into it, Kevin. But before I bring him in here, all right, so I want to get talk about the shifts in so-called bioethics and and what we were mm -hmm. trained versus what Kevin has been recently been exposed to. But how's your health? Update everybody on that. Great. I, I think you know most people who are watching probably know I I uh, was relatively recently diagnosed with breast cancer. It was uh, July of last year. Fortunately, because I am pedantic about my annual mammograms, it was picked up very early on a screening exam. Um, I ended up having uh, surgery within days of my diagnosis. I did 20 rounds of radiation. I was still on the show with you last fall during radiation. Mm -hmm. I did 20 rounds of radiation. I uh, didn't miss a show, didn't miss a beat. Um, but it's a, it's a relatively ex exhausting little process. Uh, and then I had a move. Uh, I moved physically. Physically um, over the holidays, so it. Uh, I really, I feel great. I am more and more disillusioned. I have to say, with the algorithmic sort of prescriptive way uh, things about medicine, there is no such thing anymore, really, as individualized medicine. Uh, and more and more physicians that I run into who are in control of my own care really default to, well, you know, here's the protocol, you know, here's, here's what the, mm. and, what, and what you read, what I read into that is, you know, uh, here's what big pharma says you should do, Kelly. And as you, if you know anything That's about me at all, uh, I, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, I, I rejected the chemo that they, you know, was suggested. I rejected those things. I'm going down um, a, a different path with things like vitamin D and prolonged fasting and uh, lots of reishi mushrooms and turkey tail mushrooms and lots of things. So I did in part you know, sort of what you'd consider to be the mainstream treatment, uh, surgery and radiation. Um, but I chose not to take what I consider to be toxic medicines um, that really do a hit job on your immune system, because I believe fundamentally that my immune system is my best chance of uh, fighting this and making sure that I remain cancer free. Susan, interesting. She's taking turkey tail mushroom. Do you know the other, <laughs> do you know the other name for that? Uh, Versicolor. Coriolis Versicolor. Coriolis. There you go. Right. There you go. I know yep. one part of it. Yep. That's right. We have a great sponsor for dogs, pets, and humans now, Kelly. You should know mm -hmm. about. We can it's, supply Kelly I do with Yeah, we can get you free shit. I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I do know about that. And I'm a, and, and again, this is, to be clear, these things I'm talking about, whether it's prolonged fasting, turkey tail and reishi mushrooms, vitamin D. These are not, quote, you know, snake oil. There is tremendous decades-long 
evidence that these things have a profound impact, not only on the immune system, but on cancer. It simply doesn't make it into the mainstream journals, Drew, because the pharmaceutical companies don't stand to make a lot of money on it. OK, this isn't snake oil. This isn't kind of some like one off that I read, you know, in Women's Day or, you know, Reader's Digest that somebody said, you know, try these mushrooms. There are decades worth of data. And in fact, if you go to any of the big cancer uh, treatment centers, uh, primarily in Europe, if you go to Switzerland or Sweden or it, they will start you on all of these things immediately, including mm. ivermectin, by the way, and fenbendazole and some other things. These are so well established. Uh, and that's why, Susan, uh, turkey tail mushrooms are in the formulations that they put together for animals because they have such a proven, profound impact on the immune system. Barsh Bar just uh, texted me that she sent you a package. Yeah, Kelly, and so. Drew shook the yes. bag, and Rex is running around this room sniffing to see if Do I have a to, cookie. Want me to throw it to are you? Those, are <laughs> those the dog cookies yeah, or the yeah. horse? No, horse those cookies. are the dogs. Yeah, well, give. Yeah. Oh, Sorry. he just ran out the door. Well, he'll be back. But anyways, we love them. I, I feed them to the dogs oh, every day. Oh, the other day one's getting into it. I know. She's really <laughs> Well, you should start no, taking it's, them it's to really yourself. Start eating them yourself. <laughs> yeah, I, I we know. have. they have supplements yeah. as well. That mm -hmm. um, We had Christina Ferrari on, and she was diagnosed to, with cancer. Myeloma. Myeloma. She was supposed to die in two years, but she, she took these supplements mm -hmm. and did stem cells. And she yeah. she's it's been six years. Well, she did stem cells. She had a bone marrow transplant. Didn't Wait, I thought she said she did stem cells. Bone marrow transplant with stem cells. Okay. Yeah, well, so. but that's important yeah. to know. Yeah, all this stuff, yeah, this, it's complicated, but Kelly does, let's, the point I just want to emphasize that Kelly doesn't do things lightly or without a great deal of no. thought and consultation, particularly with her own right. health. You should have seen how quickly she right. got that biopsy done after the... the uh, and doing it naturally yeah. to, to build your immune system <laughs> yeah. is basically what they're saying these <laughs> mushrooms help with. So I, I'm yeah, kind of buying it. So... Well, Go ahead, Kelly. For, for all the people out there, by the way, I mean, this is the truth. I do think in today's world, you've got to be your own advocate. Um, it, when I had my mammogram, they saw something that they thought was suspicious. The recommendation was it's, quote, probably nothing. Let's repeat the mammogram in six months, which would have been just a couple of weeks ago. Um, I said, NFW, how about let's put a needle in it and find out what it is. I don't not waiting six months. And if I had, I might be, have a very different story to be telling today uh, yep, because six true. more months would have gone by. Um, and that's a long time in the in the life mm -hmm. of, a, of a new untreated cancer. So number one, mm -hmm. I pushed for it. I got the biopsy done very, very quickly. Uh, and I wasn't willing to sit around and wait until I got, you know, my ducks in a row to have the surgery. I had my surgery five days later. Um, and I recommend to you that if you do get it, it is, it's no less of a um, shock and a wake up and a, oh my God moment when you hear the cancer mm. diagnosis when you're a physician, it doesn't make it any easier. And so I would right. strongly recommend that you be your own advocate and get on the road quickly to get the first part done and then give yourself some time to figure out the rest. Um, you don't have to, you know, buy into this idea that if you don't start chemotherapy tomorrow kind of thing, uh, you, you've got time to figure it out. And I made a different choice, uh, despite the fact that, you know, my oncologist was really promoting one course of treatment. I said, thank you. I've you know taken that under advisement and I'm going to take a different path um, for the time being. For the time being, and I think there are lots of resources out there that you can rely on, other than uh, just the mainstream oncology way to go. Well, let's get Kevin in here. Kevin, uh, let me get you some of his. Very proud of you, Kevin. Yeah, this is good to have you back. Uh, Kevin Thank Bass, uh, Kevin N. Bass on Twitter, uh, and again, uh, Kelly, of course, is Dr. Kelly Victory on Twitter. Um, Kevin has had a, just a, a crazy story. Um, he uh, went viral after saying he, scientists should admit when they were wrong about COVID. Right, truly radical position. Imagine that. People, <laughs> people admitting when they were wrong. No and, way. And apologizing and changing course. Like, shocking. Uh, he um, was resisting mandates uh, and has some interesting observations about medical school. He's a PhD. He was a scientist trained in science prior to going to medical school. He was very concerned about... Um, 
people who were resisting lockdowns early in the pandemic and then started looking at some of these arbitrary decisions and came all the way over to the other side. So please welcome Kevin Bass. Welcome get back, Kevin. Thanks are. for having me, Chuck Drew. So I, I guess where we wanted to hopefully start this conference, first of all, I tell everybody how you're doing. I mean, this is our first time seeing you in a while. And, and si last time we, you and I, we really just discussed your transition from thinking that everyone was bad who resisted lockdowns and evil and wanted people to die to going all the way to the other side where you were resisting a lot of things. Yeah, I'm doing well. Uh, this last year, you know, since we last talked has probably been the craziest year of my life and I've had a, a quite eventful and, and interesting and colorful life. And so uh, that being the fact, the case uh, uh, set really says something I didn't expect uh, after I did speak out about lockdowns, and especially uh, or about COVID policy in general. I didn't expect for especially if this is at the end of 2022, early 2023. This is when the culture was starting to shift. Uh, I didn't expect for uh, the response to have been so hostile to me within medicine as it ended up being. Uh, it it's, it's quite a shock. If you read uh, the novels of Sol Solzhenitsyn or, or, or some of the other uh, novelists who talk about tyranny or totalitarianism, uh, I, I, you know, it sounds crazy to people who haven't experienced it, but I'm afraid that uh, we're creeping or maybe even uh, accelerating in that direction in this society. And it's very terrifying and and shocking for me to, to make that realization. Well, Kelly and I wanted to start with the idea of bioethics. Now, Kelly, I'll let you frame it for him if you want about how we were trained in very rigorous bioethics and how that's right. no longer being taught and something else is superseding that. Yeah. And, and so what I would say is I think the change, Kevin, and obviously Drew and I are considerably older than you and considerably further in our, our careers than, than you are. So I, there has been a significant change in the approach uh, in medical schools. I would submit, however, that this long predated COVID, and I'll talk more about that later, but, uh, and that, but we see it now that COVID sort of brought it to to the everyone's mm -hmm. consciousness and i think in my experience what i have witnessed is that there's been several things happening simultaneously one is a slow and insidious shift towards focusing on the communal versus the individual a change towards where everything changed towards what is good for the group, what is good for the whole. You saw it with managed care. You know, we need to be equitable with regard to our usage of funding. And all of a sudden, you know, what are the core? If, if pe people look at the, the four pillars of medical ethics, the very first one is autonomy. Autonomy means you. You are, you are not responsible to anybody else with regard to your medical decisions. It is you as an individual. You have bodily autonomy. You have a right to make it to choose or to, you know, to not choose to participate in any particular thing medically. We've abandoned that. We have pushed to the polar opposite where it's all what's good, you know, to, for, for everybody else, what's good for them. So that happened and they really started pushing that in, in medical training. And the other piece that was happening simultaneous to this, I think, um, is the don't, what I call, you know, don't believe your lion eyes that we are hit every day. We are just bombarded with what I see as fundamentally propaganda, um, I don't care if you want to say, you know, it's, yeah, you know, the, uh, you know, your, your car causes climate change, but Bill Gates's private jet doesn't, uh, the economy is booming. Um, you know, the, the, the protests were peaceful. Um, you know, men can have babies, whatever it is, they, they tell you something and they say it over and over and over again. And if you push back on that thing, you say, well, I don't really think the economy is booming. I mean, groceries, are, they, they, then you are sort of a heretic. If you say you don't believe in climate change, you're a heretic. If you don't believe that men can have babies, you're a heretic. We, we will not tolerate that. You must believe this, even though it doesn't comport with what you're seeing. You know, that everybody's dying of COVID and you're saying, seeing everybody dying of COVID, you know, I, but you, you are forced into that. And once they start doing that in something that goes under the bailiwick of what they're calling science, you know, if they're calling that the fact, what do you do with that? And so start with, talk a little bit, you know, you have a PhD. <laughs> I assume, you know, you were in, you, you were trained in hard science. What 
we used to call science, which is now not what we call <laughs> science any longer. <laughs> so, so talk a little bit about your experience going from somebody getting a PhD to what you saw once you were in medical training. Well, uh, well, well uh, Kelly, my story was, is I did the first two years of medical school and then I did a, a, a longer PhD. Uh, and it was during that PhD period where COVID happened. And, and I think a lot of the culture and medicine had been changing prior to that point. But, uh, and my cat, my cat is, 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 uh, uh, choking or something. So I'm, I'm being a little bit distracted. Um, hairball. So, hairball. <laughs> Needs a mushroom. Get it a mushroom. So, so during the, um, uh, things had been changing within medicine for years. I think starting, especially in the two thousands, I think that's when the shifts really started happening. And I think that started happening in the, in the broader culture in general. I think it started happening in our elite and our professional institutions and the media and the legal system and public health across our uh, professional institutions. I think we, we, we started seeing a shift, a uh, political shift to the left, especially if you look at the, some of the uh, objective data on donor on um, political donors. So uh, but I think whenever things really radically shifted, like it was a slow buildup and then things sort of broke, the dam broke. I think that happened in the later half of the 2010s. And so I was doing my PhD during that period. Things were relatively normal during my first years of medical school. But whenever I got out of medical school, when I went back, sorry, when I got out of my PhD, graduated, went back to medical school, things were completely different. Uh, and so I had gone in training as a scientist. And in fact, uh, during much of my PhD work, I did a lot of uh, misinformation debunking. I would I would look for for people on the internet who made claims that were maybe went beyond what the data suggested, and I would debunk them. Write these long posts about it. I became very well known for how rigorous and meticulous I was about this. Uh, and I was very I had a very pro establishment side of it. I, I'm almost I would say naively pro establishment side, but I tried to be very evidence based. And so I was very idealistic about the science. But whenever I uh, first sort of woke up to COVID right near the end of my PhD. And then whenever I went back to medical school, I saw that things had changed dramatically. And what I think, uh, from my point of view, one of the things that I've observed that's happened is that um, we once valued a wide range of different uh, values or principles like autonomy, like you're pointing out, uh, moderation, rationality. And I think a lot of that's been replaced by a kind of left-wing fundamentalism, uh, which which uh, emphasizes that uh, uh, the world is filled with oppressors and victims, and that it's sort of the job of the professional class of doctors to sort of help out the victims, to, to elevate them, and sometimes, and sometimes elevate them above everybody else because they've been historically victims. This is sort of the basis of DEI. And I think this was the basis of a lot of things that happened during COVID is we thought, okay, people are dying from COVID. Uh, these are victimized people. So we have to, to emphasize this. If we can only save, if we only, if, if, uh, if only one life is saved, it's all worth it. So therefore uh, lock the whole society down to protect the vulnerable, the weak, well, we, we're uh, uh, sort of transform all the society and cater to that particular small group of people. And I think that that has been the sea change within medicine, sort of the shift to the left, sort of the shift to this victimization uh, mentality. And, and the problem with that is that when you have this one single principle that everybody has to follow, then all the other principles become sacrificed to that principle. So then science becomes sacrificed to that principle. Facts become sacrificed to that principle right. because all the science, all the facts have to match that narrative of the world. Autonomy becomes sacrificed to that principle. So you have this obsession with victimhood, with, with protecting the vulnerable, catering to them without taking into account the myriad other variety of factors that you have to take into account for in the pandemic. So for example, in the pandemic, the economy is also very important. Social life is important. People's mental health is important. Their friendships are important. Uh, and so I think that ideology has by subordinating all those other principles also uh, decreased competence in our society because if you are promoted or if you are allowed to stay within medicine or if you are uh, able to get a leadership position based upon your sort of blind adherence to this or maybe not so blind maybe uh, you'll talk out the side of your of your mouth in one issue and then sort of understand the truth in private if that becomes the criteria for career advancement then um, then people who have integrity, 
who uh, may care about the truth, those people are not going to advance as much. And the people who may have less integrity or may simply speak the party line but not, may not be necessarily as competent are the ones who get uh, promoted. And so we end up with a society not only where we subordinate all these other values that are important to human life, but we end up with, in a society where uh, we're promoting incompetence and corruption. And I think whenever society becomes ideologically corrupt in that way, uh, competence becomes corrupted as well. So it really has these knock-on effects all across society that are extremely disturbing to me. And I know I've just <laughs> gone into some kind of a rant about this, but it's it's just so disturbing no, to me. No, no, no. Hold on. You, did, you actually did not rant. Both Kelly and I are, are in rapture. We like rants. We're, we're, but this is well, not a rant. Well, this is a very systematic review. And I, and I think we have a lot to hang on there. Kelly, I'll let you comment. Then I have to go to break. And then I'll come back to you, okay. Kelly, because I could. I know, I know you've got a ton of follow-on questions. Okay. This, this I, I, I do, and, and I can tell. I will tell you, it's not a rant because you need look no further than what has happened in other totalitarian, tyrannical societies. This is exactly what they do. They say this is the narrative, this is the platform, this is what you must believe, and if you deviate from that, we will shut you down. We will crush you, either literally or figuratively. And if you look at what happened during the Cultural Revolution in China, it's no different than what they are doing today. They may have physically, literally assassinated or executed physicians, but how is that? It's really not much different from crushing you, kicking you out of medical school, taking away your medical license, kicking you off social media, giving you no voice. It is fundamentally the same thing. It's saying we will not tolerate a deviation from what the state has said is the accepted narrative. And we can talk more when we come back after the break about the stultifying effect that that has on the advancement of science. There is no advancement of anything. And it absolutely, to your point, Kevin, makes for a very, very weak, non-resilient society. Mm. It makes a society mm. that's well. easy to control, but it makes a society that is at huge risk because it is not resilient. 100%. And and. Agree. And science the same. I mean, the whole discipline of yeah. how we the how we use the scientific method gets adulterated. But let's take a little break. Uh, we've got a lot to follow on with what Kevin just said. I I I, I thought it was not a rant because rants tend to have a way of wandering. I thought you you but made, I still it, you like made perfect sense all the way. <laughs> uh, Kevin Bass, Kelly Victor, we'll be right back after this. You asked for it, and the wellness company has delivered. The medical emergency kit, replete with ivermectin, prescription antibiotics, and more, continues to fly off the shelves. We keep one here at home. And there are three new kits you need to know about, and more are coming. The Contagion Emergency Kit was inspired by the high demand for the medical kits. In that Contagion kit, you'll find ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, antibiotics, budesonide, and a nebulizer. And a must for your next trip is the Travel Emergency Kit, something I made sure exactly what I give my patients is in this kit and some more. The kit includes remedies for jet lag, variety of infections, even GI ailments. Imagine your flight getting grounded anywhere, say even in the U.S., and you start getting sick. You do not want to be at the mercy of the U.S. healthcare system or any healthcare system. At home, we keep the ultimate first aid kit on hand. It has over 20 essential supplies and medications for situations when time is of the essence. Order one for your car and your go bag. Because these kits contain prescriptions, your purchase includes a telemedicine consultation as well as an instruction manual. Go to doctor.com slash TWC for 10% off. That is drdrew.com slash TWC for 10% off all your orders. I'm very excited about these kits. Go to drdrew.com slash TWC. Are you one of the millions of American women and men dealing with premature hair thinning and hair loss? Or maybe you're scared about inheriting that thinning look because it runs in your family? Start 2024 with a real solution that delivers results without the harsh side effects or unwanted chemicals and no need for prescription. Provia uses a safe natural ingredient, Procapil, to effectively target the three main causes of premature hair thinning and hair loss. By supporting healthy scalp circulation, the delivery of nourishing nutrients, and healthy hair follicle anchoring to your scalp, Provia guarantees more hair on your head than in the shower or on your comb. Right now, new customers save over 50% plus free shipping. Every introductory package includes a full 60-day supply of Provia serum for daily use, plus the Provia Super Concentrate for faster, more noticeable results. Don't wait. Order now to save an extra 10% and get free shipping at ProviaHair.com forward slash Drew. That's P-R-O-V-I-A-H-A-I-R, ProviaHair.com slash D-R-E-W.
We are back with Dr. Kelly Victory and Kevin Bass. Uh, Kevin, of course, has a Substack. It is kevinbass.substack.com, Forbidden Science. And as I said, you can follow him on Instagram at Kevin N. Bass and on Twitter the same. Uh, my dog is here looking for more of those uh, mushroom tweets, <laughs> uh, treats. Uh, but uh, you'll see his head pop up here in a second, I think. But uh, Kelly, before the break, we were talking about Kevin's uh, statement, really is what it was. Um, and he, the way he's laid out what he had seen and what he was, you know, it reminds me, do you guys know who John Rawls is? He was a philosopher that really started this whole theoretical frame of, you know, the, the worth of a society was its uh, ability to care for the most vulnerable, even if, it was, even if right. all of the social resources were poured into a single individual, that's what a good society would do. And it's just, it's, again, it's just not even like, connected to reality to do that kind of thing. It'd be wonderful if that's how the world worked. It doesn't. Uh, but go ahead, Kelly. I think you had some more stuff for Kevin. Well, well, I guess what I was going to say, and it, you, it's actually what I said in my you know intro that you showed, uh, my pre-recorded intro, was that it is the mandate of public health. And you remember, the people who are at the helm of this debacle, and that's what it was for COVID, are all people trained in public health like I am. But it is the mandate of public health to consider the impact of these different, whatever mitigation scheme it is, on the entire population. The idea of even uttering the phrase, if we can save just one life, is preposterous nothing from medicine. a public health perspective. Go ahead and play it. <laughs> and that doesn't boil down to a risk-benefit calculation. It is the mandate public health to consider the impact of any particular mitigation scheme on the entire population. I had not and, noticed and so, the skull until so, now. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, alas, poor Yorick, I knew him well. Mm. Um, but uh, truly, in other words, we should have been, they should have been, they had an obligation to consider what is the impact going to be on the economy? What is people's economic health? What is the impact going to be on people's spiritual health to shut down churches? What is going to be the impact on educational health and so on and so forth? So, And they didn't do that. They adopted this ridiculous idea um, that we are going to eradicate a particular disease, which is not what public health is about, uh, or certainly not in a vacuum. Uh, the bigger issue, I think, is the one that Kevin and I were both touching on, which is the impact this has on society as a whole. If you want mm -hmm. to have a society that's easily controlled, you, number one, you know, put them into a state of fear. You numb them with drugs and alcohol and social media and things that keep them in a little box and keep them from thinking for themselves. You give them a prescribed uh, thought a list of you know acceptable thoughts, acceptable ideas, and you absolutely terrify them that if they step outside that that box, you know they will there will be severe consequences. As I said, whether it's you know literally being locked up, uh, you know imprisoned or figuratively, that makes for an easily controlled society. It certainly doesn't make for one that's resilient, however. In order to be resilient, I mean, this entire, our country was founded uh, on, a, on a bunch of rebels. They were renegades. There were people who said, you know what, we don't like your dang ideas, and we're doing something different. We're stepping out of the box. You have a right, or you did, you know, prior to COVID, you had a right in this country to be wrong. You had a right to go out and say something that was wrong. Uh, you know, I said many times during COVID, if, if Galileo were alive today, we would still think the earth was flat because they would have shut him down. Yeah. They would have said, no way. You know, the, the novel ideas, the really remarkable ideas rarely come from the mainstream. They come from the fringe. It's the people on yeah. the fringe who come up with those yes. ideas. And, and Kelly, not only the fringe are there, are there, but but typically, if you go back to the history of Galileo, for instance, they're considered dangerous ideas, right? Perhaps, right. Dangerous ideas. Right. Uh, he he went at the very nature of mankind, where man mm -hmm. existed in the universe, what God was doing mm -hmm. here. All that was mm -hmm. challenged. Yeah. And guess what? It was a good thing 
to challenge right. all those things with dangerous ideas. Kevin, I want to go back to you. I, one of the things that has come clean to me, come, come a little bit clear to me, or not, I wouldn't say clear, an issue that has come up uh, after talking to Brett Weinstein a couple of days ago, Weinstein, I beg your pardon, he was saying that he feels like there is a consolidating force afoot and it tends to be a force that hides things from the public. This whole thing that you're you're sort of chronicling, Kevin, to me was a shock. I was really a shock to see what happened to this profession that I've loved, that multiple family members have been in for multiple generations. Very deeply disturbing and shocking to me. Do you have any sense of what why the why this is happening with the, the amount of enthusiasm it is? And is it just being so well executed that people aren't able to kind of push back and challenge and have alternative points of view? Yeah, I think that the reason is, and I don't know the, the exact cause, but the reason is, is that for whatever reason, um, up until about 2000, uh, there were conservatives, there were there were liberals, or, or we, we call them left-leaning people now because we want to avoid, you know, sort of calling them liberals uh, because we think classical liberals. But there were left-leaning people, there were right-leaning people, uh, and they were roughly equally distributed in the institutions uh, apart from the universities. In the universities, you had a concentration of left-leaning people. It's, it's skewed maybe 80% left, 20% right. And then about around about 2000, 2010, in the 2000s, uh, you had a shift, not only in the universities to become even more left-leaning. So it became not 80% left-leaning, but like 90 to 95% left-leaning. But then through all of society, it started to look like the skew of the universities traditionally, uh, say from the 80s to the 2000s. And so uh, the politics of all of the elite professional institutions, whether it's law, whether it's media, uh, whether it's medicine, public health, uh, artists, every white collar professional profession uh, now skews overwhelmingly left. And that's historically unprecedented. Um, whereas if you look at the blue collar occupations, say plumbers, electricians, people who I, I, I'm assuming maybe a, a large part of this is that uh, they're not tied to corporations. They're sort of independent and maybe that has something to do with it. But there is more of a balance that remains in these uh, professions. And so that's where usually you have the Trump voters. And then but then in sort of all the professions that dominate the cultural and, and professional aspects of society and, and, and increasingly in the government as well, uh, you, it's starting to look like the old political skew of 20 years ago of the universities, but it's across all of society. And so you, you ask the question, how is it that this is happening? How does it seem so overwhelming? Is it just particularly well executed? I think it's the fact is, is that it's ubiquitous. There's an organic coordination between people from all sorts of different professions that belong to the same sort of social class, these upper middle class, upper class, they all believe the same thing. So in unison, uh, they're, they're coordinating with each other without even needing to necessarily uh, tell each other what to do or, or necessarily be commanded. Although to some extent, they are also receiving, uh, you know, some orders, say, for example, Fauci, they have this enormous respect and, 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 and the deference to Fauci. And now my dog is barking. I started out with the cat uh, <laughs> coughing her head while the dog's barking. Okay, don't worry. <laughs> um, Not a problem. And and so and so it's not coordinated in the sense of everybody's okay. We're going to scheme together, rubber hands together. They all share a common worldview without needing to even communicate to each other what they believe the good is, and they instantaneously can perceive what they think the good is, and that will match across all of these very powerful institutions, people across all these powerful institutions. So it, it looks coordinated, it looks uh, very well choreographed, but it's not. What's choreographed and what's what's uh, coordinated is the ideological takeover. And the question is, is what caused that ideological takeover? And I can't quite understand it. I know that in the 1960s, the late 1960s, if you think of the old radicals from 1968, uh, a lot of those people who are, who, are, who are far left, who are Marxists, who are in the new left, SDS, people know about some of this history, who are, who are involved in those student protests, they ended up becoming professors. And uh, it may be the case that those people, those young people who became professors, it must have been in the 80s and 90s, they trained the next generation. And that next generation is, is now the people who are part of these, uh, leading these professional institutions. Uh, and, and so it may be the case that, that this is a sort of ripple effect from the 19, 
the late 1960s, the universities got taken over and then progressively because the universities got taken over and the universities gatekeep for the rest of the professions. Eventually after that happened and then the rest of the professions got taken over. And this is what uh, commentators like Christopher Rufo call the, lo the long march through the institutions. And this is a sort of neo-Marxist concept where they actually planned on doing this. They had this strategy. We can't take over society through uh, economic means. We're going to take over it through cultural production. We're going to take over the universities. Then we're going to progress take over the professional institutions and it may be the case that this is simply the a reflection of some uh long planned thing that started in the universities and has eventually uh they've succeeded and so now we have i think a a a, a fight on our hands if we want these more traditional values of of autonomy and i dare i say of rationality of of all sorts of other kinds of important human values and principles that are that are essential to the flourishing of human life essential to resilience as as kelly pointed out uh if, if we lose these values if we if we become subordinate to these power structures then uh, we're going to lose that resilience um it may be up to us to now fight this and try to reverse course which is what people like christopher rufo is doing now it sounds like almost like i'm doing a a big promotion of 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 uh, of, of mr rufo but uh uh, he, he's a big inspiration of mine. And so uh, I think what he's doing is very important. What's being done in, in Florida is very important. And so I think that's maybe part of the path because I think that's the only way we can reverse the situation. And so I, yeah, anyway, I, so. I, well, I hey, Kevin, you're, like it, you're evol go ahead, Kelly. Go ahead, Kelly. I was going to say, I, I, I don't think there's any part of this that isn't orchestrated. I don't believe that it started in the universities. I believe the universities and the education system was co-opted by the elites. They, they were a pawn. They were the way to get this done very easily. Um, what is happening it, to me is right out of the playbook of every tyrannical uh, totalitarian society. I don't care if you're talking about you know, Mao Zedong, uh, whoever it is, what happened in Nazi Germany is what I call the hateification of society, where the elites identify a, what they consider to be a common foe. In Nazi Germany, it clearly was, you know, the, the Jews. Uh, in, during COVID, it was first the virus itself, and then it became anybody who didn't wasn't in lockstep. It was the non-mask wearers, the unvaccinated. And you, the, the powers that be, the people at the top of the pyramid say, you would be able to get on with life. Your life would be good. You would be more financially well off in the case of uh, what they said in Nazi Germany. You would be, be able to get back to school and you know rid of the lockdowns in the case of COVID were it not for these people, this enemy. This is what you need to focus on. We need to all focus on this enemy, the unvaccinated, the non-mask wearers, the Jews, whoever it is. And if it were not for those people, you would your life would be good. So it's the hateification, the absolute purposeful division, right? Driving a wedge. And as long as you have, you know, a third of the people who go along with the narrative, a third of the people who are kind of undecided and don't really know, it's easy for those two thirds together to gang up on the one third who actually has a clue and is pushing up and back and saying, because you, the numbers are always on your side. The numbers are always on your side in that tactic, and it's very easy. And so I think they used the universities fundamentally as the cudgel to really get in it, this insidious way of teaching your children, of saying either, you know, if you want to pass, if you want to get along, if you want to advance, you will do these things. And I'd like to kind of kind of shift or at least pivot into how the whole DEI and gender issues, how that has become part and parcel of this entire conversation as well. Um, you know, you've written at least or spoken about the you know the whole idea of DEI. Clearly, in my mind, it has a horrific impact on the uh, competence of our society. You know, when United Airlines is more concerned about saying that they have more trans, uh, you know pilots than than any other airlines rather than they've got the most competent pilots uh you know when when that when the the uh you know gender ideology or um you know any of these ideologies these gender you know uh, these this impacts politics we're not talking about competence anymore we're talking about ideologies that have really an undermining effect so talk a little bit about how you see the whole dei and gender component uh factoring in yeah so i, I think um i think uh dei and the whole gender thing and 
uh, COVID, they're all sort of symptoms of the same basic worldview. Uh, again, there's a victim and then there's an oppressor. And I think t- to your point about uh, authorities using these ideologies to gain power. I think that's absolutely right. I think that there is some sort of coordination between the ideologues, whether it's an informal coordination or maybe even they're probably getting along together uh, for d- to eat dinner and and, and even and even <laughs> talk about these things uh, informally as well. But uh, there is there is a coordination between sort of the ideal the ideologues and people who are trying to get power. And I think that this ideology is a means to power because you are subordinating people's autonomy. You are subordinating the r- resilience. And whenever you do that, they are easier to control. Uh, uh, Z Van Fleet said the same thing on uh, the recent Tucker Carlson episode where she talked about uh, the, the um, what was it? The cultural revolution in China. She said, you know, Tucker asked her, you know, why, why did people do what they did for the cultural revolution? She said the same thing that you did. Uh, it's because they wanted power. Uh, that was right. their, their, their mechanism, their method to get power. And so, uh, I wrote, uh, I think, two weeks ago, uh, a, a, an article in the New York Post about DEI in medicine in particular. Uh, and again, it's it's all reflective of the same thing, gender, race, all these things. You take one group that you consider subordinated, one identity that you consider subordinated or vulnerable or weak. And again, to Drew's point, I think it is very important as a society. I do think it is very important as a society for us to look after the vulnerable, for us to look after the weak, for us to care about people who don't have it as well as us. I think that is a, one marker of a civilized society, and that's the, but that's not the only value. But what DEI does is they turn that into the only value. And so uh, instead of teaching, for example, cultural competence, as they used to teach you guys, uh, they're teaching something more like cultural humi- humility or even uh, uh, considering... <laughs> They even teach people like Ibram X. Kendi, who who says that we need to actively discriminate against white people because we've historically discriminated against blacks. And so we need to equalize the playing field. The only way to do that is discriminate against whites. And then to sort of do this reverse racism, where we're lifting up black people and we're sort of denigrating white people. Um, and so uh, I think that's just incredibly harmful for healthcare for obvious reasons. A, a lot of our patients are going to be white people. Uh, and so we should be trying to give uh, fair healthcare to everybody. Of course, we should have cultural competency. If we should understand where somebody's coming from, they may not have the means to afford certain medications, et cetera. They may communicate in different ways and being able to to familiarize ourselves with that will allow us to provide better care. Of course, that makes total sense. But then then to then to buy into this political aspect of it is completely unnecessary. It's unnecessary for the practice of medicine. And in fact, it's harmful. And it's what's being pushed by the the main accreditation organizations in medicine today. So the American Academy of Medical Colleges is pushing this. This is a core competency that all medical colleges, all medical schools have to follow. They all have to follow this DEI idea, which is a politicized idea that's not that's not related to these true uh, to true cultural companies. It's a it's a political thing. So then the question becomes: Why are they pushing politics, which comes from these this political ideas from critical race theory? Why are they pushing that in medicine? And the only thing that I can come up come up with is that uh, these these elites are literally trying to politicize medicine. They're trying to politicize doctors. Oh. You know, yeah, it, okay. which is which doesn't matter. I mean, that's not a real. So it's about something else. I don't understand. Honestly, hundred percent. In fact, in fact, let me just take from there, Kevin, a a hard example of how this politicization of medicine has a negative impact on the quality of care. It's something I've said for a couple of decades now. When they started pushing that the increased incidence of colon and breast cancer and the poor outcomes in colon breast cancer cancer in African Americans was a result of quote inequities in the healthcare system. And I said, no, actually, it's a result of vitamin D deficiency. It's because African-American, Blacks, dark-skinned people are profoundly vitamin D deficient. And if you actually corrected for vitamin D levels, you would find that outcomes between Blacks and whites are actually the same. It is not because of racial disparities in the healthcare system. If you make it about that, if you instead focus on that and focus everybody on correcting the presumed this made up racial disparity, rather than correcting the one thing they could correct, 
the vitamin D level, you would actually have different outcomes. And again, you're getting people to focus on this ethereal sort of, you know, existential idea of racial disparity rather than on the actual science, which would show you that this is something that's very easily treatable. We have been under treating it. Let's focus on that. And so there I could give you example after example where that is the case. It's absolutely the politicization of healthcare, and it's to our detriment. The quality of care falls when you focus on the hateification and on some thing over here that supposedly has to do with diversity, equity, and inclusion and all this other stuff. And it's all because doctors were poorly trained in gender ideology. And if they only knew that, it, no, we need to return medicine, healthcare, and science to those things which are not political. There should be nothing political about it. I agree completely. Uh, so sorry. Well, I was just going to push back a little bit and say that, look, we, we all want to uh, do what we can to improve whatever social ills are out there. But training physicians, learning medicine rigorously is hard. It is, dude, if you're going to actually train high quality physicians, I, I don't understand how you can focus on anything except training in the clinical sciences because that is a that is not just a full-time affair that's an affair that takes up 20 hours a day where you're not sleeping at night and yes to add another thing in that we need to be aware of and pay attention to I, i'm all for that i'm gonna pay attention to all of it but to to do it so completely that you leave behind things like bioethics and autonomy and decision making and risk reward analysis with your patients and seeing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of a, a given case. I mean, you need to see if you know if you're going to be an internist or a rheumatologist. Certainly, you've got to be see hundreds of cases of lupus and scleroderma, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And you have to, and they all have to be very, and they're very different and protein in their manifestations and how you approach them and how you treat them. You've got to have exquisite amount of experience with that. I I don't know how you would fill your head with anything else if you're going to be properly trained, Kelly. Am I missing something? Well, well, no, and, but I, and I think the thing is that if you're doing this in preference, if you're focusing on those things, Drew, all of this DEI stuff, everything in preference to competence. If you take my example, go outside of medicine for a minute. Go back to my example with United Airlines. If United came out and said, we had 50 pilots who all scored the same on their exam, who all showed the ab the same proficiency, the same competence mm -hmm. in flying a 737, and we made a choice of all of these highly competent, equally, equally competent people and chose instead to hire the trans, uh, the trans pilots versus the non-trans pilots, that would be one thing. But that's not what they're saying. What they are saying is we focused, we made an effort, we put a stake in the ground that 50% or 100% whatever they said of our new hires were going to be trans. They're not focusing on competence. They're putting something else above competence. And I fear that the same thing is happening in medicine. When you are putting, you, you are at shifting the focus away from competence uh, okay. Mm. I had some, one of the greatest insults I had early in my career, is somebody said to me that I was the best female trauma physician they knew. I said, why would you say that? Why am I not the best <laughs> trauma physician? You know, why am I the best female? I don't want to be the best damn female, you know, yeah. I want to be the best trauma physician. You know? <laughs> so, so, so screw yeah. you. Like, you know, I mean, I, that's yeah. how I took it. I, I, I don't like, I, I what yeah. is that? Well, Kelly, if it um, makes you it, feel any better, a, a tire just came off of a United uh, flight from LAX. Caleb, Caleb to... keeps putting the video of it. Here it is oh, again. Yeah. There's so the fire, the tire the, falling There off is no it. confidence right. in the in the airline industry at all. So why should they raise the bar? Well, that's it, not the pilot's fault. That must have been a DEI hire. That must have been a DEI hire, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, that's that's really one of the that. But by the way, guys, that is, isn't that one of the most awful consequences of this is when something happens and people go, oh, it "Must because it was a DIE." That's awful right. that we had, that people think that way. But but they've created this in a certain ways, and that that's a really yes. to everyone's detriment. Um, we got to kind of wrap up here. We could go all over the place uh, where there's so much to talk about. 
Um, Sorry, I was walking the dog because I thought. Here's he a to, question that right. here's a question that I asked to wrap with maybe Drew. I asked Kevin this when we were getting in the green room prior to coming on. I said, you know, with everything you've been through, and with the unbelievable changes that have happened in healthcare, uh, with this massive shift uh, away from core science and the egregious censorship and all of this, do you still want to do it? Do you, why do you want to be a doc? What 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 motivates you to? go back and do this, go back into the cesspool. Yeah. As we were talking about, uh, in there in the green room, uh, before this episode, it, it's, it's pretty simple. I may not believe in, well, let me, let me put it a little bit differently. There's many things that are wrong with the institution of medicine today, but I still believe in the ideal of medicine. I think medicine needs people who think differently. If I'm afraid if I'm afraid to then assert myself and say, hey, look, things do need to change. I'm going to enter medicine anyway, then things aren't going to get any better. And in that sense, I'm failing uh, I'm failing the patients that um, whenever I decided to apply to medical school, to enter medical school, I'm failing the patients that I made an oath to serve. So I have to keep going on their behalf, even if the institution itself uh, has its issues. We need more of uh, our young physicians with that attitude, that's for sure. And Kevin, just so I understand your sort of history and evolution, when you were a PhD student and writing all the debunking uh, uh, sort of notes, um, were you a le were you left leaning at that point? Is that how you would have described yourself, or were you just a classical liberal, or, or what, what? How would you have described yourself then? Yeah, I, I would say throughout most of my life, I was, uh, I was even, I would even call myself a Marxist. I was far left, uh, all the way up till, um, yeah, I would say I was still far left. I don't know if I, I what I'm changed, the, how, how did that change? COVID changed me like COVID really melted my brain. Um, and, yeah. and whenever I said what I said, you know, honestly, I said what I said about COVID, I thought it was going to be like any other thing I was debunking. Right. I thought it was going to be anything else. And then suddenly, like, I was just awash in, in people, uh, in these comments. And like, it, it was different whenever I, as soon as I did it. And then I kept pressing with it. And, uh, because it wasn't like any other issue, because it was so political in a way that I didn't understand whenever I started, I had no idea at the beginning. Uh, and because I essentially like lost 90% of my friends immediately and many people who had been my friends, stabbed me in the back, betrayed me. Uh, it was, it, it changed me as a person. Fundamentally, it changed my identity. It changed the way that I understood politics because I understood something seriously sick, uh, was going on in our society because of the way that I was treated whenever I said these things. And so I, yeah, as I said, I originally thought COVID was just going to be like any other thing I was debunking. Uh, and then I realized I was in this really weird political space and then it fundamentally changed my political identity. It was a, it was a very, uh, it felt almost like I was disintegrating for like the first three months or so after I uh, spoke out about COVID, wrote that Newsweek piece. And so, it, yeah, that's that's what changed me is COVID. It was, that was my red pill moment. Well, I think, you know, I, I think that's the, the critical piece is that I would tell you, uh, and I've said from the very beginning, I find that things that, you know, people in Hollywood, uh, people have said despicable things or people have said hateful, heinous things. Um, over the years and during this uh, pandemic in particular, but I defend their right to say them. Okay, mm -hmm. that, that the First Amendment, the First Amendment is is to protect the people from saying those things that you find objectionable. That's what it's about. Uh, and the old adage that if you don't fight back, you know, if you don't speak out when they come for the Jews because you're not a Jew, if you don't speak out when they come for uh, the scientists because you're not a scientist, if you don't speak out when they come for insert whatever, no one will be there to speak out when they come for you. And they will. And they did, Kevin. They came for you. You didn't expect it. It came out of the blue. And I am grateful that it was a wake up call for you and that you have the humility and the insight to have seen it for what it was and to say, wow, we can't let this happen to anybody else. Uh, and I will, you know, I can disagree with people all day long. And, uh, you know, Drew and I really tried with this show to model 
the, you know, what, as I said, was the cornerstone certainly in medicine prior to uh, COVID, which is robust, vigorous debate, the ability to have differing opinions and to have a respectful debate with somebody who is diametrically opposed, for example, to you on something about science or politics. And to have that, we are in a heap of trouble if we shut that down. So God bless you for speaking out and for having your, you know, your aha moment. Uh, we're happy to have you. Thanks so much for, for apologizing. You doing, what you're doing. Yeah, no, yes. Um, it's, it's what I had Thanks to do. And, and thank you guys so much for doing what you do because uh, by you modeling that, uh, you're changing the world one ep. One, I mean, it sounds you're, but you're changing the world one 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 episode at a time for real, or one mind at a time, hopefully. But Kevin, we will continue to follow along as you uh, on your little journey, and uh, you're welcome back here anytime. If you have something specific you want to report, we're of course open to it. Kelly, we've got to get you back in here on a regular basis. We'd love to have you, I've and great to see great. you looking so vibrant and healthy. Thanks. And uh, thank you, Susan. Somebody on on. Uh, YouTube said, oh, did she have some work done? <laughs> <laughs> That's how good no. you look. <laughs> no, I didn't I tell him. I, I didn't tell him. No, I did not. <laughs> you didn't need to. <laughs> the only work I had done was below the neck. <laughs> and it yeah, wasn't yeah. by choice. <laughs> well, I know fine. I know moving moving is like a death in the family. Like I moving it, is so stressful. It yeah. changes it you just it's so much work. And, you know, we yeah. missed you. We know that you had a lot going on and we appreciate that you took a break and got your stuff done and your Thanks. studio looks great yeah. and your lights and Thank it you. does look like you had some work done, but you probably, <laughs> you know, did, have just been not. healthier. Maybe got, maybe got a little extra sleep, hopefully. A little I think, extra I think sleep, your maybe. lighting's good too. So that always helps. <laughs> um, we're getting we're getting new lighting for Drew while we're out of town next week. It'll be fun to see if it's just having uh, lighting envy. I know. It looks so, good. All right. Awesome. We got I gotta kinda wrap things up here, but Kelly, great to see all you. Right. Thank you for joining great us. To and we'll see get you, you back very soon, I hope. Let's you as do well. It soon. Uh, bye bye. And upcoming, let's just give the guest list here for you really quickly. Uh, we are going to have on Tuesday, Corolla. Wednesday, Fela had to drop out. We'll get a guest in there. Thursday, Christine Anderson. You remember her firebrand from the uh, EU. Mike Benz to talk about his theory of the intelligence community. Dr. David Cartland's coming in. Warren Smith. Greg Luciana from Fire. Peter McCullough and Steph Colson in on March 27th. We've got a lot of stuff coming around. So uh, do stay with us. And... Uh, Anything else from anybody? Caleb, Susan, uh, Tuesday is, I, I think, at a slightly different time. Is that correct? I don't think With so. With Corolla? Is it? We're, oh, yeah, 3.30. We still, 3.30 or something. I, we still don't know the exact time. I think he kind of makes his own rules, so I'm not really sure when he's showing up. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can always start the show and just pop him in at any right. time, but we'll figure it out. And then right. we'll have Kelly back when we are when we travel. She can host. It must be great to have her with Peter McCullough when he comes around. Yeah, so. yeah. All right, everybody, we will see you on Tuesday around 3 o'clock Pacific time. Thank you for joining us. Tut Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com help. The parallel economy has empowered us to care for our health, well-being, as well as longevity. Likewise, for us pet parents who now have a place to go when it comes to keeping the family dogs, cats, even horses in the best shape possible. As a dog dad, I'm thrilled to be working with Pet Club 24-7, a company founded by two guys who lost dogs to serious conditions, including cancer. Pet Club 24-7 has an incredible array of products, including a line of supplements for humans, such as the Inforce Plus Corollius Versicolor and Inforce Corollius Versicolor with Reishi. My friend and colleague, Christina Ferrari, a cancer survivor herself, swears by it. When I was diagnosed, the doctor in the emergency room told me, 
you have two years to live. Oh boy. Along with the stem cell, I took these. I have been in remission for eight years now. For dogs, mush puppy treats are a fan favorite. Rex, went, oh boy. <laughs> he came right. Oh, there he is. <laughs> they are also made with the Coriolis versicolor mushroom, which supports their immune system, according to hundreds of clinical studies. Here's Kristen Ludlow, National Vice President. That strain does matter. We do have the most potent strain, and we also extract it in a proprietary way. And that's why we've been having such wonderful experiences with these products. Mush puppies are made here in the U.S. There are no fillers. It's not addicting. Your dog can't accidentally overdose. Go to drdrew.com slash pet club 24-7 for a discount off the list price. That is drdrew.com, P-E-T-C-L-U-B 247, Pet Club 247.